presentation today. Um, uh, Dana White is joining us as the presenter. Dana has been with the Tennessee Valley Authority TVA since 2005. Um, a variety of roles, including operation and maintenance of nuclear, coal, gas, and hydro generation facilities, um, as well as support roles in corporate safety, business planning, engineering, and technology. Um, before joining TVA, she worked for Southern Company for 16 years at the Farley Nuclear Power Plant, where she held a senior reactor operator's license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. She has a BS in electrical engineering, that's my degree as well, so um, from the University of Alabama. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, as currently the general manager of the field services, she's responsible for overseeing work management, outage planning and execution, technology support, and key business processes for TVA's coal, gas, and hydro fleet. She'll be talking today about the value of pivoting, um, both for the power industry, but also for herself professionally. Um, I'm looking forward to this talk. I hope you all are too. I'll hand it over to Dana now. All right, thank you very much. I am excited to be with you all this afternoon. It's a, it's a great honor. I'm gonna share my screen here and I will uh, do my best to navigate <laughs> this. Are yeah. you all able to see my screen? Yeah. All right, um, great. Um, as Dr. Kishore said, I'm Dana White. I work for Tennessee Valley Authority. And um, I'm gonna talk to you about power generation and learning to pivot. And so um, I'll tell you about TVA, um, about myself, and about my um, growing interest in Dare to Lead and building relationships. And then we'll have some questions as, as Dr. Shankar mentioned. And so I'm just going to point out what the word pivot means, although I'm sure you know, but uh, it's important to point out the importance here. So to turn or twist or to change your opinions, statements, decisions, um, so that they're different from what they were before. Okay, I'll start with TVA. We, um, people often think that TVA is supported by taxpayers, um, but it is not. We are a public power utility and we are financially independent and have been self-supporting since uh, 1959, and that includes now both our um, power generation and our stewardship and economic activities. So we don't receive any taxpayer money. And because our money comes from generating power, I'll just give you a brief overview of the system. Then I'll tell you some of the history of TVA that's particularly interesting. So we provide power across seven states here in the Southeast. We have around 260 nuclear, coal, natural gas, and hydro units, as well as solar energy sites and one wind energy site. We also own over 16,000 miles of transmission network, high voltage lines, substations, switchyards. We actually own um, transmission, but not distribution lines that are lower voltage that go into your um, communities. Okay, TVA actually, the story of TVA starts back in 1916 and in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Um, it was actually during uh, President Wilson's tenure as we were going into World War I. And at that time, we were needed a munitions facility and the dam there. So we built the dam and began building munitions. However, um, prior to really getting that fully in progress, World War I was over and that was not really needed. But in the meantime, Senator Norris, he was a very huge proponent of public power and rural electrification. And he started putting together, you know, a plan for integrated resource management across TVA. And I'll just this slide is, a, is an older slide, but it gives you some idea that Tennessee Valley Authority is much broader than electric power generation. Um, we deal with water storage, navigation of the Tennessee River, um, 
surveys, you know, we, we deal with social and economic issues. So there's a lot um, that TVA consists of that may is probably different than some um, publicly owned utilities. So for a while there, um, Muscle Shoals facility and Senator Norris's idea for the Tennessee Valley um, kind of stagnated. His bill, what Senator Norris's bill wasn't passed right away and some other things were done there at the Muscle Shoals area. But as we go into the 1930s, President Roosevelt was elected and we were in the Great Depression. And so that the area of the Tennessee Valley was hit particularly hard. So here are some homes, but lots of flooding, um, soil erosion, uh, very poor population in the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, low literacy levels, largely unskilled labor. And this is when President Norris's bill and idea um, came to the forefront again. And President Roosevelt created um, TVA in 1933. And so in May of this year, TVA will celebrate 90 years um, of being a public power utility. And we're really, really proud of that. Um, when you look at what has been done, you know, the, the language in the New Deal program and around the development of TVA uh, was very visionary and um, is a way of utilizing the resources in the valley and um, transcending them beyond just power development. And I'm just going to read uh, one, a statement that from the act. This is, I therefore suggest to the Congress legislation to create a Tennessee Valley Authority, a corporation clothed with the power of government, but possessed of the flexibility and initiative of a private enterprise. It should be charged with the broadest duty of planning for the proper use, conservation, and development of the natural resources of the Tennessee River drainage basin and its adjoining territory for the general social and economic welfare of the nation. Um, as um, employees, you know, of Tennessee Valley Authority, we are very proud of the fact that our mission is really not about generating profits for stakeholders. And, and don't get me wrong, um, that, that's very necessary. And I have worked for a stakeholder owned utility and they were amazing. But um, we love the idea of being about improving and being here to serve the people of the Bat Valley and make their lives better. So I mentioned that serve the people of the Valley is our mission. We have uh, three E's that we like to say at uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. We focus on energy, environment, and uh, economic development. And just a little more about the numbers, um, you know, here at TVA, we partner with 154 local power companies. Um, you know, I'm not sure how it is throughout the rest of the United States, but I did grow up in Alabama and at Alabama Power, um, in some cases, they provided distribution directly to your homes and you paid your life power bill there. We don't do that with Tennessee Valley. We actually sell to local power companies, um, 154, and we serve over 10 million people in the Valley and um, seven states, as I mentioned before. And we serve 57 large industries and federal installations. I mentioned that we have been self-supporting for uh, quite a number of years. We do uh, generate approximately $3.6 billion annually. And uh, we don't pay taxes per se, but we pay tax equivalent payments to the local communities. And that is tends to be over $548 million. All right, so let's talk about um, pivoting. <laughs> you know, the power industry is changing, has changed so much um, since I first joined 
back in, I guess, 1989. There's so many challenges that we face. Um, we've got environmental regulations that can be conflicting for us at times. And certainly we see that as the politicians that have more influence and authority in those in position, their, those politics certainly change the direction and the speed of the environmental regulations that are, that are occurring. And that sometimes can be hard because as uh, presidential and Congress changes, you know, there may be a slowing down in environmental regulation that it gives us room at the same time when certain pop parties come into um, more positions of influence, then that speeds things up. And when we have to meet environmental regulations and make adjustments, it tends to be large investments, so a large number of dollars. And at the same time, the actual build and construction can be very challenging as well. I think we all, um, another area with public opinion and what the customer wants with the addition of social media and that becoming so much powerful over the last um, 10 years, it's much easier for the public and their opinions to have an influence on what, what we're doing and where we go. You know, both our um, people, residential customers and large companies are very interested in having a renewable portfolio to reduce the carbon footprint on the environment. And so where a lot of the things we did before were um, less obvious, people just relied on the power to be there all the time. They didn't think about where it came from or the, or the logistics of that. Now people are demanding that we have cleaner, um, more environmentally friendly, energy at the same time they want reliability of their electricity certainly you know um, the pandemic and COVID has changed some things for us right you know being able to do something like this through webex but um, in addition for our employees at tennessee valley we do have some population who generate power who actually work at our power plants and who work on our transmission lines that are out in the field continuously. And that really didn't change, couldn't change um, as we went through the pandemic. At the same time, we have a large number of hybrid work from home employees, and that creates some challenges with employee engagement and sometimes a feeling of inequity because they may have meetings and they're at the plant or they've been out in the field all day and they see others working from home and some don't feel that compensation um, accounts for that appropriately. So those are new challenges um, that we deal with. Cybersecurity has become another huge area for us in the last several years. We need to invest in our hard assets that generate electricity and take our power from where we generate it to where it needs to serve the customer. And, and we want to, you know, we've, our preference would be to spend the majority of our money there. But as new cybersecurity requirements come about and things change, we've had to put a lot of money into our um, software applications, the infrastructure that support those, it's just, um, it's a lot to manage and another change. We talk about energy demand, and I think Rudy probably remembers this from his times at Tennessee Valley Authority. We used to see a lot of load growth, say 10 or 10, 15 years ago, but in the last, say five to eight years, it started to level off. And so when you think about your long-term planning as a utility, you, we have 20 year projections where we are making um, educated decisions based on what we anticipate load to do and all the different things that are happening in the world and the cost of fuel. But we have been for a number of years as we built out our power portfolio, thinking about um, 
steady load or even declining load. But something that has challenged TVA in particular in the last year and a half to two years is as the pandemic has eased up, there has been a lot of unexpected load growth in the Tennessee Valley, particularly in the Chattanooga and Nashville and Memphis areas. It's great that the Tennessee Valley is a desirable place for um, companies to come and grow their businesses because that is a way that Tennessee Valley helps, the, how Tennessee Valley Authority helps the local population is by helping bring in job opportunities for them. But that, in addition to the fact that many people being able to work from home has found it desirable to move into the Tennessee and surrounding areas because the cost of living is lower, but they're still able to work at jobs that may be in California, for instance. And the number of houses that are just going up everywhere in the area has certainly um, been great, but has challenged our ability to provide power to the area. We have seen a great deal of load growth last summer and through this winter that has surprised us and made it hard for us at times to meet the demands of our customers. Tied to that is fuel supply, right? Um, coal is needed for the coal plants we still have, and we're certainly retiring those. But for those that still exist and are a critical part of our power generation portfolio, we have to get coal to them, and it's challenging to get the coal and to have contracts in place. We have had people, we've had coal companies not meet their contractual requirements to TVA due to force majeure. And this past summer where, you know, our goal is to have 30 to 40 days of coal on our pile um, at a coal plant, 30, 40 days of coal for generation. There were times where we had uh, last summer, eight days of coal on the pile at some of our generation facilities. And we were running our gas plants full force. So we had to have the coal generation to meet demand. So we were in a pretty tricky place last summer just because of the fact that we had increased load growth and challenges with our fuel supply. Um, and then probably the last thing I want to touch on, and I, I don't know how many people see news about the Tennessee Valley Authority um, where you were at, but we had a um, interest, a very, we had when Storm Elliott came through um, December the 23rd and 24th, uh, we were extremely challenged at TVA. And for the first time, in our almost 90 year history, we had to ask, ask our customers to reduce residential load, which resulted in some rolling blackouts in some area, some areas of the Tennessee Valley. That, that was a shock um, to our customers. It, it was a surprise to us. But I would say that we, we knew there would be a challenge, but there were a combination of things that happened. We lost two of our large, our, two of our largest units, our coal units at Cumberland Fossil Plant that first night as it started to get really cold. And we've dealt with cold weather before, but when you look at some of the charts, it was like a 43 degree drop across the Tennessee Valley and where some of our plants were within a matter of three hours. And in addition to it, the extreme cold, there was extreme wind. And where you have made changes to your plants to protect instrumentation and other things from freezing with heat trace, we were in conditions that were beyond the design of the plant. And that heat trace in many cases was not able to overcome the cold and the wind. You know, sometimes you put, we had heaters, even temporary measures in place, 
but your heater, when you've got that much wind, it, it doesn't allow you to concentrate the heat where it needed to be. So we lost two large coal plants. We lost several of our gas plants. We did have purchase power agreements in place and that, that's a normal thing to do, right? We, we work to, to minimize the cost to our customers by balancing how much our generation costs versus what it costs to buy from others. And, and it's normal for us in the Southeast and throughout all of the United States to buy power from surrounding companies. Well, we had purchased power agreements in place, but when we started dealing with the extreme weather and lost units, and as the cold weather spread further throughout the Valley and throughout the Southeast, our neighboring utilities had similar challenges. And so the commitments that we had um, for purchase power agreements, they, the companies were not able to meet them. So it led to us on two different days, both the 23rd and the 24th, getting into challenging situation. And we are doing a lot of work in response to that to prevent that from happening again. Now, as someone who lives in this area, I think the likelihood of an extreme cold weather event um, similar to Elliot is not extremely high, but the likelihood for extreme heat and humidity certainly is something that challenges us every summer as it did last year. And in addition, you know, I mentioned the load growth. That was another thing we saw that surprised us was how load changed so quickly and went up so much as the temperatures changed. And this may seem minute, but as we look at what happened with the load and the timing, it's believed that many people, well, it is true that many people in the Southeast have heat pumps, but there's a certain temperature below which your heat pump no longer functions very efficiently as a heat pump and uh, your emergency backup heaters have to come on to supply heat. And so in addition to everybody's heat being on, when we got so cold, all of those electric backup heaters were a factor. And we certainly could have done a better job communicating what was coming and asking for customer support as well in reducing their loads. I spent more time on that <laughs> because that was something new, um, but you may, if you've heard it in the media, it may be something you found interesting. Talked a little bit about this. You know, we do have a mix. We are investing in cleaner energy. Um, this shows you our mix from FY05 to fiscal year 22 last year, and then what we anticipate in FY30. So you'll see that in uh, 05, our coal generation was over half of our energy provided. And when you look to uh, fiscal year of 30, it's 5% really, and may even be less. We have continued to be um, pressed to retire our coal plants earlier than planned. At the same time, that makes it challenging for us to meet um, situations like we had during Storm Elliott that we've retired a good number of our coal plants. So renewable energy is great. There are certainly challenges that come with renewable energy that we still have to work to overcome with technology. Right now we have over 2,800 megawatts of solar and have planned to um, expand that tremendously over the next few years. We're really being um, mindful of encouraging electric vehicle utilization in the area and us along with several other utilities in the area, we're working to get electric vehicle charging stations um, conveniently located across our large highways and major travel areas. And then there are um, our carbon reduction goals. All right, I'm gonna pivot here from talking about TVA, electric power generation and tell you a little bit about myself. 
Um, this is a busy slide. Um, however, I preferred to tell you about myself through pictures <laughs> instead of just words. So I grew up in a town called Clanton, Alabama, very small rural area, well known for peaches. Although Georgia is known for peaches, Clanton, Alabama is, um, it is the place to get peaches. Uh, I grew up with my mother who primarily raised by my mother. She was divorced, got divorced when I was under four years old. So she raised two children um, pretty much alone with the help of my grandparents, but my father was not very much in the picture. We lived in a single wide small trailer um, near my grandparents. I have an amazing sister. I am the oldest. Um, I like to tell people that I learned my leadership capabilities uh, through going to senior reactor operators training. My sister says that I was bossy from the moment she arrived <laughs> and that uh, my leadership skills developed when I was telling her what to do. I remember many a day her telling me, you're not my mother, you're not my mother. But I will say that my mother worked in the sewing factory, very little money, but she did impress upon me and my sister that we needed to be capable of supporting ourselves. So she instilled in me how important it was to get an education, go to college, not rely on others. Um, I went to uh, the University of Alabama when I graduated high school. I, I went in um, 1985. I did graduate really early. I was like 10 years old when I started the University of Alabama. So nobody be doing any math about how old I am. Um, I'm a huge Alabama football fan. Um, also, Alabama's doing pretty good in the basketball uh, area right now as well. I studied uh, electrical engineering and graduated in 89. I started at Southern Nuclear Operating Company in Dothan, Alabama at Farley Nuclear Plant. Started out in their maintenance and operations support and engineering. Pretty quickly became interested in getting my react senior reactor operator's license. I got that, I think it was in 93, um, ooh, cobwebs. Um, but I was really, really proud of that. I was the third woman at Southern Nuclear, at Farley Nuclear Plant to get their senior re reactor operator's license. And the two women ahead of me were, were absolutely amazing. So I was blessed to have some, some great mentors going through that. I am married. I have uh, three daughters. And we love Cabo San Lucas and have another uh, trip planned there this June to celebrate a number of uh, major milestones in, in our family. Um, I have six grandchildren. There are the, the two youngest there, Liam and Grayson. They live in Woodstock, Georgia. And uh, I'm a proud aunt. Um, this is uh, my niece and nephew there, the blonde girl with the um, handsome young man beside her. That's my niece and nephew. Some very, very important people to me in my life. Um, I'm a dog mom. I actually should have updated this photo because when I did this presentation last year, I had this Dotson and Sheepadoodle. I now have a Bernie Doodle. So got two big dogs and this little Dotson. And I will say that she rules the roost, the little Dotson does. Um, as you can see here, she's willing to show her teeth and let the others know that she is the boss. I did start my career at Southern Nuclear, but I transitioned to a job at TVA in 2005. Uh, my first job at TVA was at Watts Bar Nuclear Plant. However, I moved to the non-nuclear side of generation um, probably after about four or five years. I had a stint as the safety director. So there go. Um, I never thought I would be the safety director for a utility. I think this was actually when I worked with Rudy. 
but when they tell you that be careful what you complain about, um, you may get responsibility for it. So I think I must have complained one too many times about not getting the support I needed from our safety organization. So I landed there for a while. It, it was a great job. Um, and I also worked at Widow's Creek Fossil Plant, which has since been um, demolished. If you, if you want to see some very interesting videos, we have demolished several of our uh, coal plants. And you can find, if you search TVA, um, Widow's Creek Fossil Plant, we just uh, recently took down some stacks at Allen Fossil Plant. So there are great, cool videos to see when they demolish these large plants, but I'll tell you, it is, uh, it's heartbreaking too. Um, I understand why we need to transition to cleaner energy, but when you go to these coal plants in some of these rural areas of the Tennessee Valley, um, there are people who their parents and grandparents worked at these coal plants. And um, then there have you know multiple generations that have transitioned through some of them. You make lots of relationships um, that as we've had to close, close coal plants, people transitioning to different jobs, just changes the way of life so much for the people that work at those plants. I, I think that we, while it's necessary, I think we underestimate the impact it has to the, the people in that area, the people that work there and the people in the area. And then also um, in my non-nuclear generation side of things, I've done a lot of work um, with at our other non-nuclear generation sites around replacing large components. So you see a, a generator here being um, trans moved into one of our gas sites. And then here, this Dare to Lead emblem, I've most recently gotten more involved in activities with inclusion and leadership behaviors that through um, Dare to Lead. So we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, my current role, as I said, I'm in generation services, non-nuclear generation. Um, they did a good job of explaining what we do, but we do everything that supports generation. <laughs> we uh, have the engineering side of the house, large projects, help execute outages, all of our um, performance improvement programs around safety and corrective action. And then just a bit more about me. I love these um, word, I don't know what they call them, word puzzles, word graphs uh -huh. to, yeah. <laughs> um, so I am a lot of different things rolled into one as we all are. I'm, I consider myself to be very determined. Um, some might say stubborn instead. Although I have an engineering degree, I really think of myself more as a power plant operator. Um, I, I just, those people that make um, electricity operating the plant at the equipment day in and day out. They've got a really um, challenging job. Um, some days I'm a hot mess, frazzled. <laughs> Other days I'm supportive of others, trying to enable people to be successful. Tend to be an introvert. Now, some people don't always believe that because I can talk a lot. Um, the thing is with an introvert is that all of that peopling sucks every bit of energy out of me, even though I enjoyed it at the time. I usually need to, after I've spent a couple of days with people, I need to find a nice hole somewhere <laughs> with just my computer and me and do tasks. Um, there's comfort for me in doing tasks and uh, getting things checked off my list. So. All right, so I didn't put it in my, uh, slide of photos that I have a Peloton, but you could get me talking forever either about my dogs or my Peloton. So you, do, you have to be careful if you ask me questions about those. But the reason I say that I have a Peloton bike, love it. But this quote right here is from Robin Arzon and she is one of the instructors. I think she's actually a vice president of the company now. 
She's amazing, very strong woman. But I saw her post this on social media and it really hit me um, because sometimes you, you, you get frustrated, right? And you, and you change paths and you feel like you may be quitting. But I loved this take on it. Um, it's important to acknowledge that sometimes you need to pivot. That includes changing your mind about a goal or an objective. The process to get to that objective or the timeline for that objective. Pivoting with a perfect purpose is different than quitting. It all comes down to having honest conversation with yourself. Is it a pivot or is it you simply not showing up for yourself and then calling it something more palatable? That nuance really does make a difference. So I'll, I'll fit that in. Um, as we go forward. So as a woman who started in the electric utility industry in 89, ooh, a long time ago, then and even now, um, the energy industry is a predominantly white male workforce. And uh, that makes it hard at times when you're different um, than everyone else. And that go is true for so many of our historically marginalized groups of employees. I went on shift after I got my NRC op senior reactor operator's license. And I distinctly remember one, I was a shift foreman and uh, my manager, he said, told me that shift work was no place for a woman. So that was also like hard when you've just gotten, gone through an 18 month training program. You haven't really worked on shift and operations and you get there and people are telling you that it's not where you should be. You started out from early on in my life. I mentioned that, um, you know, my mother inbred in me to be tough, strong, um, independent. But as you get, as you hear that and you make that one of your mottos, you also find yourself continuously having to prove yourself over and over again. When you get on shift with a bunch of people different from you, when you get promoted to um, a job in a different area, if you go into from operations into engineering, as the leadership changes, um, so many times I feel like I have gotten to a good place with the current leadership regime. They know who I am, only for them to all get changed out. A couple of new vice presidents coming in and there you go again, you've got to start over. You've got to rebuild your brand. And uh, you know, at one point hustling for your worth was seen as noble and a good thing but really in today's world, that, that's not where you want to be. Um, I constantly found um, this, that there's hard to find the right balance to be accepted. Um, for me, I found that if I was more soft, feminine, I wasn't a strong enough leader. I couldn't handle things. Um, I couldn't lead all these men. At the same time, when you go to be more direct with your communications, um, right, use your voice to be louder or clearer, um, then you're too harsh, right? So you're either too soft or you're too witchy with the B word. It's just, it's, it's hard to find um, that sweet spot. There are societal norms that are hard to break. Um, I started out in nuclear power and I put imprinting because I started nuclear power so young in my career. When you, and going through an SRO class, you were taught to give orders through emergency situations <clears throat> and direct people. Well, the environment in nuclear is also pretty harsh from a people perspective, especially then. I even had a mentor who gave me an article um, to help me be successful that was called Swimming with Sharks. 
And it basically was you're in one of these meetings with the leaders. And if someone has been wounded, they someone they've said something wrong, someone's going after them and and they're bleeding that um, you don't get in the water with them. They're bleeding, you don't try to protect them, you don't try to help them, don't go to their rescue. As a matter of fact, what's even more noble and more perceived even better is if you become one of the sharks to feed on them. And that literally was something a mentor gave me. Now, again, that goes back to it's hard when you're a woman, right? You wanna be a shark because that's what's successful. Um, and then the words used with you, lots of clicks, right? Good old boys, um, people who golf together, um, and I'm not a golfer, nothing wrong with golfing, but it is one of those environments where you don't, you don't realize that if it's more male oriented and you're doing uh, business out on the golf course, um, there are certain populations that get left out of those conversations and left out of those relationships being getting created. Um, I had some, I, I really have taken some different um, paths in my career that I didn't anticipate, didn't even necessarily want. That safety director job was one of those. Um, I was a power plant person. I always saw my career as that I was going to lead people at power plants. That was the chain of command that I was going to move up. That was a measure of success. And I have spent a lot of years um, tying my self-worth to titles. And when you don't achieve those titles and you're putting self-worth on titles, um, you start questioning if you're good enough. Why aren't they selecting me for these jobs? Why am I asked to be doing these other things? One of the things that um, was really pivotal for me as a leader, and it's one of the times where I felt like I was hustling for my self-worth, self we had had some leadership changes. I happened to be, and I'm going to talk about Dare to Lead and Brene Brown, but I happened to be in a workshop with a few of my co-workers, Dare to Lead workshop, and we were talking about um, being in the arena, right? Putting yourself out there to perform in front of everybody else. And why do you keep coming, you know, to the fight day in and day out? I was particularly frustrated. And we had talked about the arena at the end of day one and, and the beginning of day two, um, someone I work with was there. She actually worked in my organization. I was one of her leaders. And I was just very vulnerable with her and said, you know, I don't know why I keep doing this. I'm frustrated. I don't know why I keep come stepping into the arena day after day. They have given us yet a new set, a new vice president, um, new people here. They don't know who I am. I'm just tired of doing it. I don't know why I do it. And she turned to me and she said, Dana, you're getting it all wrong. She said, you are not getting into the arena, fighting the battles day in and day out to impress the vice presidents, the Jacindas, the David Sorks of the world. And I know you don't know their names. She said, you're not doing it because of them. You're doing it for people like me. You're doing it for me and Tony and the other leaders and people that work in your organization and around you that are looking to you that trust you and that you're making things easier for them. And that was the point where I started realizing that maybe my path was not intended to be about positional authority um, and leading people as a vice president, a senior vice president through titles within at power plants, but instead it was to build relationships um, and make connection with others and helping create a path for others. So, um, so the next slide. So kind of like in the idea of pivot then versus now, I first put this slide together and it was like advice to women, right? But this is advice that's applicable to anybody, male, female, 
regardless of your sexual preference, what your ethnicity is. Um, when I started in 89, it was about dog eat dog, right? That woman next to you, it was a competitor, right? We, we weren't necessarily kindred spirits. Um, I was a third woman and, and that was in some ways a, uh, a badge of honor, right? It, to be alone and first and early, early in. Had to fit in, um, had to learn to talk the male talk, the things people were interested in, pretend you had worked on a nuclear submarine or, or seem interested when people are talking about what it was like working on a nuclear submarine. Um, listen to baseball conversations. Didn't have many shopping conversations, which is what I really enjoy doing. Um, you needed to work hard, harder than anybody else and hustle to prove yourself. No emotions, keep them at home. Work is not a place for them. You gotta be tough. And I look back and think that in my career, I've told, told people those very things about how to, to be successful. And it, it feels so wrong now when I look at where I'm at, how the world has changed. Um, you know, I definitely say you've got to support and mentor others around you. Um, find how to connect with people that are different, about, different than you. Understand what's important to them. What's important to them from uh, their history, why their ethnicity matters to them. Um, be yourself, be open and honest, approachable. Make relationships rather than compete with each other. And get to know uh, those people you work, their kids, their family, what TV shows they watch. Trust yourself. Um, many times your gut and what you're feeling is, is absolutely right. And, and your gut's telling you that for a reason. So, so lean into it and uh, bring your full self to work um, and everything you do. You, you, we cannot separate ourselves. Um, from from our emotions we're human and uh, you can't step into the workplace and ignore that humanity all right so a little bit um, more on learning and pivoting uh, some of my first roles as I after I got my license you move into positions of authority right and I found that if you're going to lead people, sometimes positions of authority make it easier, right? You have a certain amount of power over, right, them. Um, you're able to give decisions, make decisions, give orders. They're kind of required to, to follow you and do what you say. Um, one of the first roles that, that I didn't want, I mentioned I didn't want to take the safety director job, but I will tell you it was a huge learning opportunity because that was a role where I had responsibility to influence all of TVA with really no positional authority. And so when you look at influence, it's the capacity to have an effect on the character and development or behavior or someone or something. And I have found that um, as I've gone through my career, I wish I had learned the importance of relationships and influence much earlier. Um, there is something about when you connect with people and they trust you and you need help and you go to someone who's up here or even higher than you and you've built those relationships and the trust. Um, being able to influence change um, versus dictate it, it is much more powerful. Uh, so now I'm going to get a little bit into my Brene Brown uh, zealotness. That's the other area I could probably talk about. Dogs, Peloton, Brene Brown. Um, so I'm going to read you this quote about trust. It turns out that trust is in fact earned in the smallest of moments. It is earned not through hero heroic deeds or even highly visible actions, but through paying attention, listening, and gestures of genuine care and connection. There's a lot, lot to be said there. So I mentioned how going to Brene Brown's Dare to Lead workshop and what 
someone I work with said to me about what why I was coming to work every day and fighting the fight, not even realizing it, but I'm a student because I have people there that I care about. Well, that Dare to Lead workshop, I went to um, just really, really made me see things differently in my career. I'll tell you though, I had before that workshop, one of the reasons I was interested in the workshop was I had gone through some personal challenges. I went to see a counselor and the counselor had turned me on to some of Brene Brown's other work. So I would, I would encourage you as you're thinking about yourself, dealing with the environment around you, figuring out who you are and who you want to be and how to be your whole self, um, please uh, look to some of Brene Brown's work. As someone who has done some um, on the road traveling, going to plants and all, audio, her audio books are amazing uh, because she narrates them. So that helps. She has a very uh, fun way of discussing topics and keeping things interested, interesting. So one of the things that, um, and this ties into some of the discussion about humanity, and I, I found this um, quote really interesting about in the past, jobs were about muscles. Now they're about brains, but in the future, they'll be about the heart. And you look back, say 1930s, 1940s, when so much it was about physical labor. Um, and then, you know, as we got further into the 20th century, uh, the importance of an education, um, it, it became all about, well, you've got to get your education, you go into professional careers, it's about brains, how much you know in books. But now as we've evolved, you know, I'd say probably newer generations getting into the workforce. You know, COVID had a prof profound impact um, on us thinking about who we are and, and what's important to us. It, it really is, uh, this connection to the heart is, is really, I think what people need now and where we're going in the future. I'd say it, it can be a challenge for those of us who started out, you know, 30 years ago to look at things that way and adjust um, our behaviors even. You know, I have found that I didn't even realize that some of my behaviors were um, exclusive rather than inclusive. I didn't intend to be that, to be exclusive, oops. So why do we need to change? I think I've talked about a lot of this, but I, I would say inclusion the diversity, you know, and, and the inclusion word is just so critical because as a woman, um, I have felt at times more included with a group of men in, in a work situation than other times that I have with what would be seen um, through your eyes as a diverse group of people. They didn't feel me, made me feel included. So we have to have both, right? We have to have people, um, of different backgrounds, different experiences, but we've got to make everyone feel valued and that they belong at the table and that they're important. Um, I think that's another thing with getting the in the workplace is you know connecting with people and getting the the full value um, you can get. And when I say value, I don't necessarily mean I want. Joe to work as hard as he can work, but I want him engaged in the problem solving, right? I, it's less about me telling Joe what to do, but engaging Joe and Ava and Victor into solving our problems and knowing what the right thing to do, because Dana by herself is not gonna have the right answers. Now I'm a good problem solver and I, and I always have an opinion, and uh, I, I usually express my opinion in a way that, that seems quite confident. And so I've had to step back from that and ask more questions because um, some of that demeanor that where I learned to be in charge can also scare people um, from bringing issues to the table. And so now if you get into problem solving where in the past I was the first one to say, hey, here's the problem, here's what you need to go do. Um, We've talked about it for five minutes now. That's way too much. Go do it. Um, instead, we need to say, okay, tell me about what's going on. 
tell me what's happening. What are you seeing? What do you think we need to do? And if someone hasn't brought their opinion up, ask them for it, bring their opinion out. So these are words from Brene's book, but any braver leaders and more courageous cultures. Um, it's, it's hard sometimes to put yourself out there. I found that um, I got so comfortable with barking orders that that sometimes felt like the, it feels like the easy route for me versus exploring maybe what's going on and what emotions may be coming to the table. We talk about leadership. Um, this definition here, anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and has the courage to develop that potential. There does not say that is someone's boss. And it doesn't say someone with a title. Um, but you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. So um, everyone is a leader in some way. All right, so we talked about some, I've talked a little bit about emotional things and that can be scary uh, at times. We don't like to talk about emotions, but um, they exist. And if we're not managing and then talking about them, we're probably dealing with negative results um, that come from not addressing those emotions. We've got to learn how to have in a kind way to have challenging and difficult discussions and understand what's going on. And this last sentence here, listen with the same passion with which we want to be heard. Whew, I am so guilty of thinking about what I want to, want to say before someone even finishes saying what, they've, what they're trying to tell me. Jumping to conclusions um, instead of listening and asking maybe some harder questions. And figuring out what they're really trying to say. And then one of the, the last thing I'm gonna to briefly mention, and you can learn more about this as you look at um, daring leadership, but the greatest barrier um, to being a daring leader isn't fear, it's the armor we put up in front of us and that we show to others when we are afraid. If you're feeling less than because of a situation, you know, my, one of my armors is being a knower. So if I'm in a situation where I'm uncomfortable or I feel less than, I'll start feeling compelled to tell you what my background is and my history and why I know enough to be at the table. Why? Um, and so, those emotions um, and behaviors that we use to protect ourselves sometimes are not becoming. And so one of the things that through learning more about Dare to Lead and being involved in these Dare to Lead workshops is, you know, I don't feel like I have changed myself. I certainly have changed my behaviors, um, but not who I am. And what I have learned is that I can better express who I am and who I want you to see about me, that I am able to communicate in a way that helps you see who I am um, at my heart and truly versus some of those behaviors where I thought um, I was doing the right thing, but was probably shutting people down and pushing them out. All right, so now, um, I'm going to see if I can figure out how to stop presenting and give you all a chance to ask questions. Wow. Thank you, Dana. And uh, very thought provoking. And, uh, you know, before I get into the questions phase, I just want to say something about Dana. I, uh, when we first started working at TVA, I thought she had the most difficult job being the safety director because you know, in a large organization such as a uh, utility, safety takes on a very large dimension. You know it when it happens. And you're just trying to corral people, be conscious of safety, I think was a arduous task. And I 
always admired how she went at it and how sometimes it could be so difficult. And uh, before that, I think you were the plant manager in Widow's Creek. Was that correct? Yes. And a plant yes. manager is a person who does not leave his or her job for 24 hours a day. <laughs> They're always on call. So thank you, Dana. I think TVA is very fortunate to have somebody like you. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to open the floor to questions from students. And students, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself. And please ask Dana a question or questions. Questions for Dana. Hello. Yes, Andy, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Andy Chung. Uh, I was wondering, because you mentioned uh, sort of creating a psychologically safe environment. I was wondering how do you go about creating that environment for employees and workers? Well, I think it does start with creating relationships with each person individually. Um, you know, it sounds pat, you know, or easy, but you know, I think that once you show people that you care about them and you listen to them and find out what's important to them, what makes them tick and you're genuine, that connection makes a difference. So they're um, comfortable bringing more challenging issues to you. But I think you also have to display those behaviors not just in a one on one setting where you're creating a relationship, but also when you have a group of people and even when you're around your leaders in that you are um, what letting other people have the floor and not for me I was always for so long I was the first worse person to speak in a conversation I, I wouldn't allow others the room to to have their opinions and voices so I think it comes to Sometimes stepping back, even in those group environments, listening, um, sometimes even um, rewarding people for asking questions or not knowing. Uh, we historically have rewarded people who had the answers and knew the answer. And that was one reason why I was so quick to have an answer when something came up. But what I'm starting to see is that. You know, if someone doesn't have the answer, let them know that's okay. Or if someone asks a question, let them know you appreciate their interest. You appreciate that they're willing to dig in deeper and um, that it's not easy. I'd say if you have someone who's not speaking in a group, if you can gently um, encourage them by asking them some simple questions just to get them engaged and feel more comfortable, so I think it's largely about that individual relationship and showing behaviors in groups that you are open to their input, re reinforcing people bringing their ideas to the table and appreciating that, rewarding um, questioning and rewarding exploring rather than always rewarding just knowing. Thank you. Uh... Questions for Dana, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself and uh, go ahead. Hi Dana, um, my name is Ryan Malarkey and I'm, I'm a part-time student in Lehigh's you know, Energy Systems Engineering Program and, and thank you so much for your presentation today, I thought it was great. Um, earlier on in the presentation, you touched on a bit <clears throat> how like extreme weather events in the area have been affecting various uh, you know forms of generation down there, and, and huge huge drops in, in cold have shut down some of the coal plants and, and gas fire power plants. So I guess I was just curious what the plan would be for the, for the TVA moving forward in terms of like weather hardening against some of these events as the climate continues to be unpredictable um, and continues to change, be so dynamic. Great question, and that's not an easy one to answer. I'll say we're we're approaching it 
on more than one level. So one of the first things that we're doing is asking, well, and, and this is a very important part of it, but asking our employees who dealt with the problems on December the 23rd and 24th, learning more from them about the challenges they encountered and what we can do to prevent them. Even some of the things that they overcame that didn't cause a problem. You know, I think it's very easy for us to first focus on the, the plants where there were known problems. And, and we certainly have to fix those things, which in many cases will be um, physical solutions, design change solutions. Um, but where the other plants where we did not lose power generation, what did they battle? right? The thing that almost got them. And um, I heard our senior vice president speak last week, and we ended up just from that first round of going to all the plants, asking those questions, trying to identify all the, all the challenges we had, the things that bit us in that didn't. We had like a list of 280 something items. And then we have worked through putting temporary, not long-term solutions in place for every item on that in case we were to have another extreme cold weather event. Now, that's the short-term um, approach solution. At the same time, we've also put together a multidiscipline team. Um, we've been calling it Poppy, but it's Power Operations Performance Improvement Group. We even brought in executives of the people from another part of other parts of TVA that had previously worked in power operations to start putting together and laying out a longer term, longer term solutions to improve reliability. And because, and some of that involves, and a lot of that's gonna involve money. And when you look at any company, right? You have to think about where you've been investing. In the, and reducing spend, right? We all have budgets. Personally, every, every company has, has money, things they have to deal with. Well, historically, especially for coal plants where we plan to retire them, we've not been doing very much investment in those plants. We've, in some ways, we've been just limping along, right? And, and agreeing as a company that we're okay with their reliability not being in top quartile or top decile. Um, we have been okay with um, some of our simple cycle gas plants, not investing in them as much because we don't need them that often. They're for peak power generation. And so we are reevaluating our investment strategy. We're gonna have to um, put money into reliability of coal plants, even though their life cycle um, is not really long. We are also going to have to think about those units that we plan to be here for the long haul, our, com our, our combined cycle gas units and our simple cycle gas units. So we're going to look to build in um, additional, we're going to take into consideration additional design items that make them more capable of operating in colder weather or hotter weather and also build in more redundancy of equipment. And, you know, if you look at the way a nuclear power plant is built, it is inherently built with re lots of redundancy, both physically and in the control systems, <clears throat> instrumentation and control systems. When you look at a uh, gas plant, we typically don't invest in them initially, design them to have all that redundancy because they're, they're reliable, them being subpar, not always reliable is, is okay. So we're gonna have to go out and make more investments in equipment to make it more reliable. And one of the things that we're trying to look at from a positive standpoint is that we have identified over the last several years, a lot of things we wanted to do to make our plants better. 
we've just not been able to get the funding. And I'm not saying TA is bad, right? It's, it's just part of running a business to think about where you're investing money. But we realize that how we've got a vulnerability here that we have not dealt with appropriately. And we're gonna have to invest more in these plants to make them more reliable, both for extreme, wet, extreme cold weather and extreme hot weather, mm -hmm. especially with this un, unexpected load growth. Because you don't just decide that today you need more electricity and next month you've got a new power plant on the ground. <laughs> so our supply chain issues we um, are finding is, is really challenging too. You think about we want to build new power generation. Well, so do other utilities in the area. And generators and turbines take a long time to build. Those materials are hard to get. And we're all competing for the same resources. Okay, hey, questions for Dana. Please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask a question. Yes, Jose? Jose, do you have a question? We can't hear you. How about now? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, sorry. Hi. Um, hi, Dana. Hi, Professor. Um, well, I, I actually, uh, I've done one of the pivots that you mentioned in your presentation. I, I relocated from New York City to New Mexico to work for a nuclear um, power startup, Kairos Power. And I know that I think we were preliminarily engaged with the TVA to demonstrate one of our prototype reactors. I I just wanted to get a sense for what the what the uh, atmosphere is like um, with introducing, you know, SMR technology into the in, into the energy mix uh, for utilities such such as TVA. I'm glad you asked that question because I did not mention SMRs, and that is a that is a fail on my part. We have actually, over the last year in particular, um, put a lot of energy into exploring small modular small modular reactors. Um, it it we feel like it has to be part of our energy future um, because when you put solar generation on the ground, for example, and and you count up like how many megawatts you have available to serve. You also have to have that equivalent amount of generation elsewhere. So it's not always additive, right? Because if the if the sun goes behind the clouds and that happens and, and we get a, a rainstorm, which happens a lot in the, um, in the Southeast, right? It's hot, humid and sunny. And the next thing you know, the clouds are there and you're getting a downpour and then an hour later, it's sunny again. Um, and so that's a big change for the for our people who operate the system. And we do feel like the um, flexibility of small modular reactors um, it will be critical to us being able to balance our portfolio in the future because where you have renewables, you've got to have some other options when those renewables are not available or or that situation changes quickly. And we actually even created a um, brand new organization in the last year aimed at um, focusing on small modular reactors and making progress there. Rudy, you'll know him, but now Bob DC is over um, the small modular reactors. Yeah. The vice president. I see it. Another area that is important that we, we look at, it's very expensive to do, but we have in our hydro um, portfolio, we have one pumped hydro pump storage facility, Raccoon Mountain, it has four units. And I'll tell you that's, although they are expensive to build, that is probably the single most important asset in our portfolio because it provides us the ability to use electricity um, and then make it at different times. So that's another thing we'll be looking more into. Thank you. Hey, John had a question, John, go ahead. 
Thanks, Rudy. Th thanks, Dana, for your comments. I, my, my career is started in a nuclear plant in Pennsylvania. Um, I've been with the same company for almost 40 years, so I can, um, it's interesting hearing your path. Uh, I went from <laughs> nuclear to the generation side, and then I've been on the wire side for two decades. And I've had several female bosses, probably more than male bosses. And it was a, it was a tough macho guy industry. I'm happy to say it's, it's turning the corner now. It took its time. But, um, but my question is, um, when you think about hiring for the workforce for the next decade, besides smart people, what, what, what are you looking for when, you, when you're hiring the, the, the new person into your company? Well, so I will tell you, um, I may give you more than you asked for, but <laughs> um, so speaking of the workforce, we are, we are struggling a lot, both with skilled craftsmen, skilled crafts labor um, in the workforce and the technical knowledge. And so I'll address those um, in two arenas. So probably one that I'm more familiar with is with our technical knowledge. So our engineers and our technical staff, we have in the last five years, put a lot of energy into inter the intern program and using that as a, um, a pool to bring in because what it does, it do it, it's a great opportunity for you to test out that employee, right? And for them to test you out to see if that's what they want to do because sometimes you just don't know. I, I, one of the things I sometimes say in my presentations is I went into electrical engineering because I was good in math and science and somebody told me that they made a lot of money compared to like a seamstress, which my mother was. And I really thought when I headed off to college to go into electrical engineering that I would fix TVs and wire houses when I got through. So I had no idea where I was headed, what I was doing. So we've invested a lot in our intern program. We have adjusted our recruiting strategies um, with our intern program. And we have had to focus on more on HBCUs and pursue areas where we're getting a diverse population. Our workforce right now does not reflect the people of the Valley. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I was just in a, in a class two weeks ago where they showed the demographics of TVA compared to the demographics of the, of the Southeast and the Tennessee Valley. And we have a lot of room to go. So we have to recruit in different places. When we get them in the door, we've got to put more energy in taking care of them and connecting with them. And when, um, if you're different, which a lot of these are, right? They look different, have different backgrounds. So we've gone out and recruited those. We have to put an energy into making them feel welcome and at home and included. So we put more energy into um, mentoring when we bring our interns in, helping them have some social connections with the other interns and with, others. And that has been um, a challenge with COVID too, right? Because now we're bringing in people to the work environment sometimes and, and they're not meeting people in person. So we've had to be very purposeful in our efforts there. Um, so that is how we're, we're focusing um, our interns, so tech, our technical staff. On the skilled labor, we're behind there. Um, when we talk about the load growing in the area, it's because there's a lot more businesses. We have tons of construction, Blue Oval in, in Memphis, uh, Nashville is expanding. Um, every, we're building new generation, we're demolishing, uh, you know, we're going brownfield and greenfield for plants that were retired. We do not have enough crafts people. Um, and so we have started, um, partnering with other utilities and other companies in the area. And we're trying to figure out how to um, invest in some vocational education and going out into the high schools and helping them see what opportunities are available and what those jobs look like. I think, um, you know, I was at something last week and one of the guys 
we were, we were talking about the challenges of getting skilled craft and somebody said, well, nobody wants to work, um, you know, in some of these conditions. And one of the gentlemen, one of the, my coworkers spoke up and he said, well, when I was um, in high school, he said, as long if it paid good money, I, did, I cared less about the conditions. I didn't know what a boilermaker did or a welder did. And so I think we have to, we're having to get into the schools earlier and help them see that for those who don't want to go to college, that skilled crafts can make a lot of money. They're in high demand and help them understand what it looks like partnering with the high schools, partnering with other companies. We are very much behind the curve there. Very interesting. Questions for Dana, please unmute yourself. Uh, you can put, put it in the chat box if you're shy about talking. Questions for Dana, we still got a few minutes. Uh, Rudy, this is how long? Okay, I have a comment. Question, comment and a question. Uh, Dana, a wonderful talk. And, and I work, I'm retired now, but I work in the steel industry. And I can see a lot of parallels uh, between uh, the steel industry and the utility industry and, um, and the struggles that uh, women have had, still do have uh, in steel industry. And so uh, wonderful talk. And I really appreciate your, uh, your comments and insight. But I have a question. This is more on climate change. I, I noticed on your um, slide that says pivoting to meet challenges, you don't explicitly mention climate change. Um, is that a political reason or, or, or I, 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 I know you're addressing it, so you don't explicitly mention it. Is that something that the company is struggling with explicitly mentioning or is it or, or some other reason? No, there, it is not um, a political reason. It really comes from me not feeling like I know enough to speak intelligently on climate change. That okay. is an area that, um, just from a personal learning and growth that um, stresses my, my technical skills at this point in my career. So now we, um, I think that it certainly is a piece of, of what we see. You're right when we talk about extreme weather circumstances, the changes in load. Um, but you have you have uh, um, zero uh, emission goals. Uh, I, you I did mention some, but does TVA have have those types of goals to um, move move from the carbon? I, I I know you are moving from, but do you yeah. have explicit goals like that? I do, and we, we do, excuse me, we do have goals, and I I'm, um, regret to say I can't recite them, but um, as a good steward, steward of TVA, I ought to be able to, and one of the slides, I was, before things started, there I did have a slide in this deck, and it was a graph, and it showed over several years, and it pointed out um, some of the emission changes and the things we were doing and what our goals were. And I told Rudy I'd send him this package um, after the presentation. I'll go grab that slide and stick it back in here. That way, if, um, if it's available to all of you, you can see it more. And then um, the, and this is said, another good place to look is on TVA's website. Um, <laughs> it, can, it can give you some more behind that. Um, I, I work in an area where I understand the climate rules the, or the, the need for, for going to zero emissions and, and why the environment needs to. I also um, probably don't talk about it as much because I can also feel the struggle that we have in making the right mix of electricity and making the right investment decisions to be able to meet near-term needs and longer term needs, it's, you know, it's really challenging because um, just on lines of zero emissions, we need to build gas plants now. I mean, like, and, and you can get a combined cycle or a simple cycle gas unit built probably the quickest of any new generation source, like when you have to get it on the ground, a new aero, gas powered aero derivative or something. And so we're investing in that area, but at the same time, you know, everything tells us there's gonna be a point that emissions from gas plants 
gas power yes. plants are no longer yes. acceptable. Right. And so then you've got to think about the next thing. So we're just, it's really hard to find the right, to make the right choices, both near term and long term. That's yeah, I, think, I think you're, I think the industry you're, you're in, needs to think about how to get there. I mean, yeah. That's only uh, like 25 years away, you know, sort of. Uh, so, and and construction costs and all that are long term. So they really have to plan now. How how are you going to get there, right? And you know, yeah, yeah. I think that SMRs are a picture. You know, I didn't talk about it because I don't. I'm not real knowledgeable. We've but we've got some battery. Um, things that we're investing in there. We do, we do have an entire organization. Actually, Rudy is our old boss, Joe Hoagland. Um, he, his whole or job and our, or the organization he leads right now is around exploring new technology to help us get to that path. And we are investing in some technology advancements and doing some things that I'm not as educated on because I'm a little more in the making electricity now side of it but um, there are a lot of things going on and it's but it's hard and we do I think the good thing our new our CEO I say he's our new CEO Jeff Lash um, he has put he's been here for about three years now I guess three or four years he has put a lot of emphasis on um, exploring the technology and TVA's history is a right, a lot of it is around technology and what we help, the technology we help bring to the area to, to make things better in the Valley. And so in some ways going into and thinking about future technology to help us is, is really part of our core mission that we have probably not focused on as much as we needed to say five or 10 years back. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your comments. A very nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I'll echo that. Um, Dana, thank you very much. This is very, uh, I'll segue into what we're going to be hearing next week. We have the director of R&D from PPL Corporation who will be presenting next week, uh, same time next week. Um, uh, he's also, they're leading the, they're not leading the part of the Southeast Hydrogen Cooperative, which I think uh, TVA is involved in too. And hydrogen is, of course, the next fuel uh, that is, you know, is potentially could replace carbon-based fuels for manufacturing. Um, the last thing I want to mention is uh, TVA, as, as Dana mentioned, has always been a leader in technologies. In fact, they are the only utility which has got a license to uh, build if, uh, if they choose to an SMR at their site. So thank you, Dana. And- uh, Thank you for having me. Thank you all. Again, uh, uh, the details of next week's uh, seminar is on the in the chat box. You can, you can register for it if you want. Uh, but we will see all of you next week, and, and uh, best of luck. I hope you have a great week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dana. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, Rudy. Thank you. Thank you.